The third annual Shea Talks event here at Ohio University. And I'm so happy to see all of you guys, and I'm glad you could make it. I would like to start off by recognizing some of our, or a few of our event sponsors, which include Triple T Transportation, Star Leasing, Artifacts Gallery, Paul Mass and Kate Federoff Mass, and Jackie Oates. I would also like to recognize our brand new charity partner, HabCap. HabCap is an amazing organization that is dedicated to empowering individuals and giving back to those in need. We are lucky enough tonight to have a representative from that organization here tonight, so give a big round of applause for David Keller. Hey, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out. As Matt said, I work with Hawking Athens Perry Community Action. Um, I am with the Southeast Ohio Food Bank and Regional Kitchen, which is a program of Hawking Athens Perry Community Action. And basically what we focus on is food insecurity throughout all of Southeast Ohio. Uh, I know you're on a tight schedule. I don't want to drone on, but you gave me a pulpit, so I'm going to use it. Um, Athens County alone, over 20% of the population is considered food insecure. When you look at our entire region, that factors into roughly one in six individuals. Unfortunately, when you look at children, that translates into roughly one in three. Um, it's a big issue. We're out there every day with our network of agencies. We partner with over 70 different food pantries throughout Southeast Ohio to provide the services and the food people need. Um, Shea Talks this year was fantastic. At my last count, uh, the money raised through this would go to support over 10,000 meals uh, when converted into that because of the food bank's purchasing power. But when you consider the ability that we have to source food throughout our region, uh, throughout our network, um, that's going to translate into roughly $30,000 worth of groceries going out to our area. So you guys helped do that. Thank you. Uh, we wouldn't be here without donors like you. Uh, if you were kind enough to go ahead and contribute to the Shea Talks program, you'll probably be getting an email from me in the next couple days, and I'm going to be asking for a mailing address for our thank you notes. So, um, you know, we're really thankful for all the donors that we have. We're thankful for people like you being invested. So, again, thank you. If you need anything, please uh, let me know. I'll have my business cards. And, yeah, thank you again. Thanks so much, David. Um, next, I would also like to welcome our judges for tonight. So we have the Shea's very own Lisa Beeler, along with Craig Burwell and Sierra Cooley from Dish One. So let's give them a big round of applause. Right, thank you. Well, I know it's the moment that we've all been so excited for and waiting for, so I'm not going to stay up here any longer, and I will go ahead and kick off the event. The first speaker we have is a junior here at Ohio University, Johnny Palmero. Summer option A, study abroad in the glorious city of Buenos Aires, Argentina, with a ton of culture, exquisite food, and exotic music. Summer option B, for six days a week in the blistering summer heat, go door to door selling satellite TV in that state up north. Guess which one I chose? Last summer, I had the opportunity to complete a door to door sales internship with Dish Network in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, I'm sure everyone in the audience has some wonderful preconceived notions about the glorious industry of door-to-door -door sales. But today, I can promise you that those notions are 100% justified and true. <laughs> Despite this, last summer was the most transformative experience I've ever had. I learned more about myself and my abilities in three months than I have doing anything else my entire life. So today, I'm going to talk to you all about my three biggest takeaways from being a door-to-door -door salesman. Number one, I learned what it truly means to challenge yourself. Just by a show of hands, how many of you think that door-to-door -door sales would be easy? Good, none of you, you're all right. Door-to-door -door sales is hard. It's really hard. But I knew this going into it. I was at a point in my life where I needed to challenge myself. I needed to establish some mental toughness. So that's what initially attracted me to this industry. Even though I was so ready to go and so excited to take on a new challenge, I was in for a little bit of a rude awakening. Let me take you through a day in the life of a door-to-door -door salesman. Every day, each of the 15 interns would wake up, 
we would do what we called a power hour, which typically involved brain teasers or motivational speaking. Not speaking, reading. Then after our power hour, we would all congregate together for what we called core. We would set our goals, get motivated, and then after core, we would hit the doors from 11 a.m. to 7 or 8 at night, all day, walking around Western Michigan selling dish, house after house. Hey, just real quick, I'm doing a ton of work out here with all the DirecTV and cable customers. Are you guys still hooked up with one of those, right? Yeah, fun stuff. The first few weeks actually went really well for me, though. I was selling regularly, I was hitting my quota, I was putting numbers on the board. It felt awesome because I was growing into this really difficult challenge that I had taken on. Around the second or third week, though, things started to take a turn. I went a couple of days in a row without selling. A couple of days turned into a few days. And before I knew it, I had gone an entire week without selling a thing. Just think about that. For an entire week, I was nothing more than an ad boy for Dish Network. It was absolutely demoralizing. But I was determined to change it. I took the weekend to rejuvenate, and I told myself on Monday, I would go out and get a sale as early as possible. So Monday rolls around, it's the late afternoon, and I still don't have a sale. What does it do? Boom, it starts raining. Just adding the overall ambience of this being one of the worst days of my entire life. But I'm still determined to change it. I go, knock on a door at this house, a kind lady answers. I start doing my spiel. She interrupts me and says, let me go get my husband and hands and stuff. So I'm like, okay. This guy comes back to the door, and he is furious. We don't want anything. You can go. Fill in the blank. <laughs> At this point, I am stunned. I had never been talked to like this before in my entire life. I just want to get the heck out of there. So I turn to leave. I say, I'm sorry, sir. I'm just trying to earn money for college. And he yells, I said goodbye, and slams the door behind me. Now, I had dealt with angry customers before, so I don't know why this particular gentleman set me off but it probably had something to do with the fact that I hadn't made a sale in over a week. Also, it was raining. I was working harder than I'd ever worked in my entire life, and I had nothing to show for it. I went down, sat on a curb, and started sobbing. This was the hardest thing I had ever had to do. And three weeks into summer, this internship had already broken me. And right then and there, in that moment, I realized what it truly means to challenge yourself. And that also served as a turning point for me. I knew that right then and there, I could throw in the towel, chalk it up, and ride the rest of the summer out. Or I could make something out of it. And I knew the former was not an option. At 11 a.m. the next day, I closed my biggest sale of the summer. It was awesome. Challenges are challenges for a reason, but they are meant to be overcome. It just gets a little fuzzy when a lot of the challenges, as a door-to-door -door salesman, are dealing with interesting people. And that is the second thing I learned this summer. People are crazy. It's true. I talked to a lot of people over the course of three months. And there are some people out there that have more than a few screws loose. Case in point, it's about a month into summer. I'm walking around. I see this dude sitting on his porch. So I come up to him, I tell him what I'm doing, and he's like, oh man, I got Comcast, I hate him. I'm like, sweet, this is going to be a lay down. <laughs> so I start talking to this guy, show him, show him what I could do for him. I'm going to be able to drop this guy's bill 60 bucks, I'm going to give him full home DVR with the Hopper 3, and I'm going to upgrade his channel package, I'm going to give him like 40 more channels, this is a good deal, people. And then he finds out that he's going to have to put a satellite dish on his roof. And I'm like, oh great. But we prepare for this. So I'm expecting to hear a normal objection along the lines of, it'll look ugly on my roof, or maybe it'll go out during the weather. No. This guy looks at me square in my eye and says, I cannot do this because I've been hearing on the news that the Russian government is hacking people's satellites and stealing their personal information. <laughs> This dude was reading some serious fake news. <laughs> I was surprised by how many just super paranoid conspiracy theorist type people I ran into this summer. It seemed like everyone I talked to like thought the government was going after them or something. I don't know. The other person I ran into a lot 
was the no soliciting side person. Oh, these people were great. These are the type of people that were so excited when I would come to their door just so they could scream at me and throw me off their porch. I always wondered what the limit of a no soliciting side was. Like, I could just see it on Halloween. Like, knock, 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 trick or treat, get off my property. Also, like Girl Scouts, did these people not love Thin Mints? I don't know. So, another story. It's the second day on the job and we're double knocking in pairs. We walk up to this one guy's house, we knock on the door, and this Pee Wee Herman looking dude comes racing around the corner and he's got this nasally voice. And he's like, didn't you see the sign? It said no soliciting. And we didn't see anything, so we're like, sorry sir, we didn't see a sign. He points to the bottom right hand corner of the door and there's this crusty like half peeled off sign that barely reads no soliciting. So we're like, alright. So we walk away. We hear his garage door open, Pee Wee Herman starts dragging his trash cans down to the curb, and he's muttering to himself, and he's walking like a stick figure, and he's like, God, I hate solicitors so much. And I look to my friend, and we start laughing. Because in situations like this, that's what you have to do. And that's the third thing I learned this summer, is that mindset is everything. Everyone has bad days. I get it. I had plenty of bad days this summer. But what we have to remember is that even though the bad days are bad, the good days are really good. I was fortunate enough to have two incredible young leaders serve as my managers for the summer who instilled this mindset in me. Every day when we met for core to set our goals, it was all about positivity. Being thankful for what we had. Enjoying this amazing thing called life. To be straight up, I don't know how I would have made it through the summer if it wasn't for thinking like this. There are plenty of days where I just wanted to throw in the towel and quit. But every day, I woke up with a positive mindset, ready to attack the day. At the end of the day, I didn't dwell on the negatives. And that's why I was able to establish so much personal growth in such a short amount of time. Looking back on this summer as a door-to-door -door salesman blows my mind. I know that everyone in the room at some point has looked at a picture of themselves as a senior and then looked at a picture of themselves as a freshman. What was I thinking four years ago? Imagine doing that like three months ago, because that's exactly what I did. I will never, for as long as I live, regret going and becoming a door-to-door -door salesman instead of going to Argentina. To close, I want to speak to one specific group in the audience. And those are the interns that will be interning with DISH this summer, because I probably just instilled the fear of God in you. <laughs> but you're in a really good place right now. You're going to do great this summer. Just think about the three things that I talked about. You're going to learn what it truly means to challenge yourself. You're going to meet some crazy people along the way, but you'll have some good stories. And at the end of the day, you're going to learn how important having a positive mindset is. I believe in you. Your managers believe in you. You just have to believe in yourself. One quick thing before I stop, I want to give a shout out to my parents who surprised me and came all the way down from Youngstown, Ohio to be here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Johnny. That was an awesome presentation. Uh, up next, we have a freshman here at Ohio University, Grace Miller. Most 
gut-wrenching fact on the side of my muddy sneakers. A serving size is only half a cup. And I just ate a pint. <laughs> so that's... Hold on, I need my calculator. I'm a communication major. <laughs> 560 calories. I just ate one-fourth of my daily calories in a frickin' snack. As I throw it away, I see something else I've thrown away. An issue of the European Public Health Alliance that states that marketing strategies are more focused on promoting their foods than putting out accurate product information. So they're getting college students to eat their emotions. Oh, 560 of them. So today, to figure out what the heck is going on with nutrition labeling, we will taste on the causes of nutritionist advertising, nibble on the effects, and munch on some solutions to what every college student in America would call god dang lies. <laughs> so, nutritionist advertising happens for two reasons. Regulations and our own gullibleness. Regulations exist on our food products so that what we put into our body <laughs> won't hurt us. Simple. However, these regulations also encourage many companies to twist the truth. According to a 2011 Live Science article, manufacturers got their packagings in a wad when the FDA required that it put potentially negative but life-altering information on their food labels, like calories and grams of fat. So these folks have been out here promoting their food like it's the best food that you can eat, but it's not. It's like when we're filling out an online dating profile. We want our best qualities to shine, even if they're simply or extremely over-exaggerated. Uh, for example, I'm 5'10 in my heart and in 5-inch heels. <laughs> and we want that stuff like emotional baggage, <laughs> or like way, way in the back. <laughs> Not saying that I have any emotional baggage. <clears throat> But that's exactly what these food companies are doing. According to a Forbes article from September of 2016, our food labels can exaggerate the healthfulness of our products. And according to an AgriLife Today article from December of 2016, these exaggerations aren't regulated. But I mean, hey, who's going to find out, right? Second, did you know that the word gullible wasn't even in the dictionary? When we're picking our foods, we believe everything that we want to hear, even if it's not true. We're so used to hearing these alternative facts about our food that we don't stop to think about the fundamental absurdity of the labeling. It's like when we were growing up and watching Home Alone. We're so used to Macaulay Culkin being this adorable little kid, but then he grows up to be like a complete freak. Additionally, according to the Huffington Post from 2016, to highlight the healthfulness of their products, companies are pointing out their vitamin A and their vitamin C. But in reality, Americans aren't deficient in these nutrients. What we need to see are more potassium and vitamin D. So, now that we know we have an eating problem, let's dig into the effects of this tricky labeling. And like the number of cup noodles left in my dorm, there are two. A false sense of health and mass confusion. Because everything we buy is plastered with these labels claiming that the food is good for us, we just believe we're eating smart. For example, fiber is good for us, but not all fiber. The natural stuff is good, but here's the thing, folks. According to an NPR article from October 11, 2017, manufacturers can declare any fiber, regardless of source, as dietary fiber. So basically, big fiber has been dumping a crap ton of processed fiber into our foods and saying, look, your daily source of fiber in these Doritos. And since fiber is supposed to be good for us, we buy it. Literally. We just believe that we're eating smart. So, our sense of health as Americans is based on our food labels, but our food labels are based on inaccurate data, so <coughs> if I still remember how logic works, our healthy eating becomes complete bullcrap. The second effect of this tricky labeling is chaos, a.k.a. <coughs> ignorance. The previously cited AgriLife Today article highlights some of this confusion we're having about healthy eating by reiterating an experience I had at the grocery store the other day. So I'm at the grocery store, right, and I hear the store clerk talk to the customer, and the customer asks the store clerk if these apples were gluten-free. 
Apples. <laughs> now, as crazy as I thought that sounded, I walked over a couple of aisles and I saw a bottle of water labeled GF. Gluten free. I don't think it's possible to make water with gluten. But with all this contradicting information coming at us, we often find <coughs> ourselves confused. According to a CNN article published on May 16, 2017, Eight out of ten individuals have reported being confused on what they should and should not eat. And when we start to question what we know about our foods, we realize we know nothing about food, about life, about anything. But what we do know is that there are solutions, two actually, on a federal and a local level. On the federal level, the government needs to make more regulations and change some of the rules that already exist. Luckily, Michelle Obama started this progress by requiring that the FDA get its act together and put important information su such as calorie counts in a larger font. Additionally, according to the Washington Post from January 17, 2016, our serving sizes need to start accurately representing what we're going to eat in one sitting. Crazy. I know. But it's not all on the government. We also need to assume some responsibility and actually learn how to read our food labels. We should know that what's plastered on the front isn't always going to be the most accurate information. So, if I'm taking my own advice, I guess my online date isn't going to look like Ryan Gosling and have a master's degree and everything, but look a little more like Dwight Schrute. <laughs> But how do we know that our cans and cartons are going to hold goslings rather than shrewds? We read. Resources like Rally Shelf Guide that help us sort through some of this omitted or exaggerated information on our food labels. So today we have munched on the lies regarding food regulations. We've nibbled on the effects of our false sense of health and we have come to the conclusion that these food companies need to stop playing around and put accurate information on their food labels, please and thank you. Who am I kidding? I still eat Hershey's ice cream. And I always will. But at least I'll know what I'm putting into my body. I'll die an educated glutton. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, the next speaker that we have coming to the stage is a junior here at Ohio University, <coughs> Ian Bilbrey. Hi, everybody. All right. So I would like to speak to everybody today about something I learned at my actual last job before I came down to Athens, uh, which is I like to call being proactively reactive. All right, so a little bit more about me. I started as a biology major at the Ohio State University, Mansfield campus, not the cool Columbus one. But I wanted to be a doctor. And it took me about a semester and a half to realize that that's just not me. So I went back to a community college up north, kind of, I'm not sure if anybody's been here, you probably know what it is. But, and I made the big switch to business. And everybody always asked me why. I don't know, I had great professors, and I grew up in a family that was just constantly business. So it was my language. I just learned to speak it. But, when I transferred out to Athens, I had a lot of new goals. So I decided that I wanted to get my marketing degree, because I decided that was the best uh, option for me. And I decided that I really wanted to get my act together with school, because I didn't really take it too seriously at first. Biology just didn't stick, and I thought that it was just because I was stupid. But, <laughs> but I came down, and actually, after the first semester here, I realized that, hey, I have an act for this, and I'm going to keep on going with it. So what I did was, I just decided to take the sales you know, experience I had, and I joined the Shea. I'm a prospect as of January 2018, and I absolutely love it. And I'm sure there's a bunch of shady people out here who actually know it's a great program. <coughs> My special graduation today is May 2019. I feel I'm really on the right track. So enough about me. So let's break this down. Proactively reactive, what does it mean? Well, what I like to say is proactive is causing something to happen in order to have it, you know, control, you actually control a situation. So an example of that is pretty much preparing. Now you go into reaction, or, you know, <coughs> So it's reacting to situations, for the definition. And you're actually reacting to it as it's happening or after it's occurred. So it's adapting pretty much at that point. Waiting until something happens, then doing something about it. All right, so what does it mean to be adaptive? It means that you have to react quickly. 
think of your feet. Uh, beyond that, you have to work out all problems, all the problems big and small, because not just be one universal size. And then you have to own situations, and you make them manageable. And so, what do you have to do then? You have to make sure that you're ready to react, though. And that's why I believe you know, that being proactively reactive really comes into play here. So, potential problems. That's the whole point. You don't want to wait for them to become burdens. Because when a problem becomes a burden, that's when it's terrible. So you have to fix it really, really quickly. So that's when you have to proactively, I'll use the sweet words at one here, proactively really react. You will learn more about the situation by doing this, and you'll be able to see it from a bunch of different angles. And once you do that, you'll gain a more, you know, a different aspects of knowledge that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And it'll give you an edge in business. Really, that's what I'm from. All right, so how does this fit in sales? All right, like most 16-year-olds, I started as, would you like fries with Adam McDonald's? Now, as I'm going to mean, I actually started there, and I moved all the way up to manager. For some odd reason, starting at grabbing a couple paychecks just didn't work out for me, and I ended up roping me into it, so I became a manager. So four years later, pretty much, I realized that their training pretty much centered you around really having to prepare for everything. So, 11.30, what's about to happen? Lunch. You have to be prepared for that. Get, out, get your stations ready. You have to prepare. You have to get all your people together. You have to make sure your things are stocked up with food. So beyond that, I took that after I finally left McDonald's, that preparation in my head. I took that to Batteries Plus Bulbs. Now, I'm not sure what you guys, you know, guys know about that store, but it does exactly that. It sells batteries and light bulbs. Now, before anybody falls asleep here, which I pretty much did the first two weeks of my job there, because it was all computer, just a monotone voice just teaching me. Kind of like college at that point. But <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it, I learned what it was. After a month or so, I actually started getting it. I realized, you know, knowledge past what a regular light bulb looked like and what the AA battery looked like. Started learning. Now, what I did there is most of my customers were old men, pretty much, I like to say, because people didn't really have too much to do. And they're like, I'll go into a battery and light bulb store because there's no such thing as Radio Shack anymore. <laughs> so, a person comes in, he needs a new light bulb for his, for his driveway light. And he wants to go with his regular light bulb, the ones he grew up with, ones we all grew up with. And of course, sell, sell, sell. I have to upsell him. So I'm going to that new LED stuff, the stuff that lasts a long time. And he says, son, that light bulb will last longer than I will. I'm like, and to be honest, it was a long day. I said, sir, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good sales technique, but that's what happened. I said, but I tell you what, sir. You'll be back here in the next two months until you die, pretty much, with that other light bulb. This one, you can sit at home and you can spend the rest of the time with your family. He, had, he chuckled, thankfully, and a bunch of things, but he, uh, he said, okay, so well, this is going to be an enclosed fixture. And the enclosed in that little painted light, this is going to light up fire. I've been seeing that on the news, the news that Johnny was talking about. People were crazy. And I was like, well, sir, to be honest, I really don't know, but I can tell you what, it's not going to be a fire hazard. We'll just say that. I ended up getting the sale without doing it too much work. It was a regular, it was a 10 bucks sale, not the big of a deal. But I tell you what, I learned from that, and instead of just sitting down, taking my sale, taking my 4% commission, <laughs> I went and looked that up. I looked up everything. Everything about it. With the light bulbs over here, I can tell you everything about it. If you want to learn, know about it, you can ask me after the show. But it's, uh, I learned everything about it. And to my luck at that point, guy came in two months later, he had the old shirt on with the, you know, the, uh, the logo for his company. He was ready to buy. He had a 150,000 square foot facility he needed light bulbs for. And he's going to a retail setting. This is cake. I was, I was super happy. But he asked me the same question. It's in enclosed fixtures. We don't want glass to break. Is it going to do it? And I myself, I'm like, oh my gosh. Studying actually paid off for once. And uh, it, it gave me a $5,000 sale in an assistant manager position at batteries plus bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the thing is, though, I came down to Athens, so I had to actually take some things from that job and take some things I learned. That's where properly reactive actually comes in. But isn't this just adapting? Because that's what it is, right? I learned from it, and I just moved out, but not really, because I had to sit down and actually do something. So, no, this is a distinction. You cannot let yourself adapt, you must make yourself adapt. But let's be honest. <coughs> A lot of adapting is BSing. Uh, most of you are Shea students, so you know all about that. 
Sorry, wrapping up. <laughs> but really, you still want to sleep on the possibilities, guys. You want to think about the what ifs. So you have to use situations as opportunities to create a foundation on which greater knowledge can be built. It's really wordy, but I don't know. I meant something. So. All right, so how does this fit into your career? Well, I just said a regular retail job I can fit into, but I'd say it's not just a soft skill. It's an attitude towards life. Because problems arise everywhere. Relationships, how much students know about those. And just everywhere. I mean, family, friends, everywhere. So you have to learn to actually identify things like red flags, indicators that something's going wrong, and learn to fix it. I'm just plain and simple. You have to take, but see, you have to take the initiative to change too. I can see red flags and realize I don't really care about the relationship. I don't really care about that class. I don't really care about my job. I'm gonna get fired, dumped, or get an F in the class if I don't take the initiative to actually do something about it. So I have to keep on building on the foundations I created and move forward. So in conclusion here, guys, what am I really saying? The ability to BS is a great trait. Adapting is a great trait. But it's not going to always be enough because really all it is is just being personable. It's just not going to get you where you need to be. <coughs> you need to keep thinking. It will always get you ahead of your thinking. The moment you have stopped thinking, you're going to become a dud and nobody's going to want to talk to you. But you also have to think about the what ifs. Just like I said, don't sleep on the possibilities. Because once you do that, I wouldn't have got my $5,000 sales I would have sat on my ass all day and I've done anything about it. But if you think about the what ifs and you actually keep on thinking and you can make it being purely adaptable as a backup <coughs> trait and actually keep on doing this, you'll be much more successful in life. Or at least that's what I found. So I'm in a really happy place right now and I'm very glad to be up here. Thank you very much, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Ian. Um, our next speaker is a freshman here at Ohio University, so I would like to welcome Kelly Thaxton to the stage. This is me when I was a freshman in high school. I don't look very different, do I? Well, although I may look happy in these photos, it was around this time that I started experiencing suicidal thoughts for the first time. I really wish that I couldn't say that sentence. I don't want to go into the nitty gritty of what happened to me that made me feel the way I did, but I can say that I felt alone. I could see no possible future for myself where I could be happy or successful. And it was those emotions that led me down a path of self-hatred, self-harm, and constant negative thinking. Around this time, I decided I wanted to reach out to a friend for help. I had known him a few, from a few clubs, and he always said, Kelly, come to me with whatever you need, I'll be here. And the way he responded wasn't what I was expecting. He said, Kelly, you're a freshman. How could you have any real problems? That didn't help. <laughs> that didn't make me feel better or validate my feelings. If anything, it stung. But luckily, I knew someplace deep, deep down, I still wanted help. You see, this whole experience for me was like I was in a pit. And slowly, I gained the strength to call for help. And after time, therapy, and a lot of unconditional love, I'm lucky enough to be here standing in front of you today. Now, I want to fast forward to my junior year. Still don't look really different. Still pretty cute though, but don't look very different. <laughs> This time, a friend came to me and said, Kelly, I'm thinking about committing suicide. When I heard that, I was shocked. I didn't know how to react. But those of you who know me know that I live in a helpful mom mode. Whenever somebody tells me that they need help, I go to as many lengths as possible to help them. So I did that. I talked to this friend on the phone every night for about a week and a half. The phone calls always went the same way. I would say, please, get help. You really need a therapist. And they would always respond, no, you can't tell anybody about this. Plus, I have you. You're saving my life. Another person's life was in my hands. And eventually, his pain and his sadness started leading me back down my own path of pain. I cried every night after I got off the phone. He would talk to me at home, at school, late at night. 
I could never escape those feelings, and as a result, I ended up being more scared and more stressed than I ever have been. Luckily, one night, while I was on the phone, my dad came in to say goodnight. What he saw was pretty horrifying. I was curled up on a ball on the floor, sobbing. The microphone on my phone was muted, and my friend kept going on about how he was planning on committing suicide. I didn't want to hang up on him, but at that time, I was so <coughs> damaged that I didn't know what to do. I couldn't hold in these tears. My dad grabbed me and said, hey, pick up the phone, tell him you have an exam in the morning that you have to go to sleep, it'll be okay. And as soon as I hung up, my dad grabbed my phone and left a message with the school guidance counselor. My dad made the right choice by making that phone call, but I didn't by keeping it a secret. And although it makes me sad to know that I made that mistake and I didn't take that action, I've learned from it. So, why am I up here talking about this? Well, I feel as though one thing that many people fail to learn in their lives is how to react when somebody tells them they're thinking about committing suicide. I've been on both sides of this, so I wanted to use this 10 minutes to have that talk with you guys. To clarify, all of what I've researched on this topic comes from really credible sources, such as the CDC, the Mayo Clinic, Ohio University Counseling and Psych Services, and Life Act, which is an amazing nonprofit organization dedicated to suicide prevention and awareness in teens. Before I start, I want to tell you guys a few things. Suicide is way more common than you think. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, it was the 10th leading cause of death for all ages in 2013. If you look at specific age groups, it's the third leading cause of death among persons ages 10 to 14, and the second leading cause of death among persons ages 15 to 34. In 2013, when the study was done, 9.3 million Americans reported having suicidal thoughts, and in that year, over 44,000 did take their lives. I'm not saying this to scare you, but I hope it'll re help you realize two things. And it's one, it's more common than you think. And two, what I can't stress enough is please care about your mental health, because it is more common than you think. So it happens, your friend comes to you and says, I'm thinking about committing suicide. What's the first thing you do? Well, it's a lot more simple than you think. Ask questions and listen to them without judgment. Think about it. When you guys are in a rough place, what do you like to do? Vent. Be an open ear for that person to talk to. <coughs> Don't discount any of what they're feeling. Validate everything and let them know you care. Be an active listener. Again, nod, hold their hand, anything that they need. After you've talked to them for a while, there's something really important that you need to find out, and that is how likely that person is to act on those suicidal thoughts. I know it's hard, but you have to be direct. You need to see if that person has a plan or if they feel as though they cannot keep themselves physically safe being alone. If they do feel like that, call 911 or get them to a hospital immediately because that person is a danger to themselves. When I felt like this in high school, I never got to the point where I had a plan because when I did, it was like I was stepping over this imaginary line and it became too real and too painful. If the case was like mine, and again, they don't have a plan, but they don't want to be alone, they don't want to be, or they don't want to be around anymore, suggest that that person starts going to counseling. This is a blanket statement for everybody in this room, but counseling is one of the best things you can do for yourself. I am so lucky to be out of a dark time in my life, but I know if I ever start feeling that again, my counselor will know and recognize those feelings and act on them. Now I know, sometimes counseling isn't always possible, either for parents or financial reasons or any of those. So there is a really other, another really great service, and I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's the American Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Again, I know you've all heard of it, but to clarify, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a national network of local crisis centers that provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you can't get access to counseling, look into this service. And great news, they've even opened a texting line. So if you're someplace where you can't make a phone call, you can send a text and they'll see, be somebody on the other line to help you. Now, what are some things that you can say to help that might make them feel better? Again, you want to make sure that that person doesn't feel alone. So tell them that. You can say, I might not know exactly how you feel, but I'm here and I want to help. Or you can say, it'll get better. I don't know if you guys remember me saying this at the beginning of the talk, but five years ago, I couldn't imagine a future where I could be happy or successful. 
But being here today with the friends I've made, the opportunities I've had, and the chances I've took, I can't imagine being in a happier place. That's an important thing to remember right there, is that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. If you're ever in a rough spot, any of you, keep pushing forward, because you'll get there, I promise. The whole message of this is in any case with somebody with suicidal thoughts, be open, be understanding, be there for them. Also, it's important to connect them to resources that will help them. I've prepared a little something for you guys, and it's this. This is a list of organizations here on Ohio University's campus that will help you if you're in a tricky situation. Counseling and psych services and survivor advocacy are completely confidential, meaning anything you tell them will stay with them. These other groups are support groups that will help you and connect you to counseling and psych if it's needed. If you don't go to OU, which I know some of you don't, here's a list of outside sources. The resources are out there, you just need to find them. All right, last few things before I wrap up. The first thing is I want to leave a message with you guys here in the audience. And it's a little cheesy, but it's that you guys are important. You're valuable, you have talent, and you belong here. There's going to be times in your life where you forget that, and it's going to be hard, but try. Try and reach out. Try and find somebody that will help you. Try and find somebody that will help you remember it. The next thing is this. Up on the screen is the number for the American Prevention Lifeline. I know you all have cell phones, and I know you all have Snapchat or social media, and it might be a little much, but I'm asking you to pull out your phone and take this and post it on your Snapchat story. There you go. Come on. I want you guys to do this because it might be the thing that somebody <laughs> needs to save their lives. Guess not right now. Thank you guys, and I hope you've learned something today, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Kelly. Sorry for the technical difficulty. The computer decided to just shut off on this. So, uh, next person I would like to welcome up to the stage. She is a sophomore here at Ohio University, and she is Taylor Charles. So, here she is. There's always going to be someone stronger than you, bigger than you, smarter than you. You can't always control that, but no one will ever have more heart than you do. Your dedication is what you can control. It's what separates the boys from the men, the mediocre from the absolute best. If you want to be the best, you have to work harder than the best, and the best, they don't quit when the going gets tough. This is something my dad used to tell me any time I felt inferior about myself. <coughs> I grew up in an extremely competitive environment, playing at least one sport, most of the time two each season. Being a multi-sport student athlete taught me a thing or two about competition, character, and perseverance. Even though I was a standout athlete, one thing I really struggled with in life was school. School didn't always come easy to me. Being a student with a learning disability, I spent obscene amounts of time on homework and studying. A constant reoccurring memory I have is sitting at the kitchen table for hours and hours on end, just trying to focus on the task at hand. Every hour that passed, I felt more discouraged at the fact that I learned differently than everybody else. It's because there's this huge misconception about students with learning disabilities. Let me give you an example. A common reaction I get when someone finds out I have a learning disability is, oh my gosh, I would have never guessed. You just seem like you get good grades. That may have been embellished a little bit. <laughs> when did having a learning disability automatically mean that I get lower grades than my classmates. <coughs> you see, society often categorizes students with learning disabilities and associates them 
with a lack of intelligence. And I, I refuse to fit that stereotype. I constantly question if my future success in life directly depended on my inability to learn as quickly and as easily as everyone else. In education, achievement is measured by grades and test scores, not necessarily IQ. This made me ask myself the question, what if achieving success in life depended on more than just a GPA? Now the real world did teach me, in fact, that success in life does depend on much more than just a GPA. But what is that thing? What is that id factor that separates the good from the great? This is a little something I like to call grit. <laughs> grit is the dedication, passion, and perseverance it takes to achieve long-term goals. Grit is falling to rock bottom and having the courage to get back up and try again. Grit takes time, lots of it. Grit isn't dependent on a person's physical appearance, physique, or IQ. Grit is having a future goal in mind and being so determined to achieve that goal that you let nothing stand in your way. Grit is like climbing a mountain. It's being completely exhausted and having nothing left to give halfway through the climb and somehow finding a way to persevere and scale the peak. In life, you're going to encounter obstacles. That's just the way it is. But do you know what gets you through it? Grit. Knowing that you are destined for greatness, that you were born to be great, knowing that you have a goal in mind and you will let nothing and nobody stand in the way from you achieving that goal gets you through it. There's a famous movie scene that I like to compare grit to. Most of us have seen the classic Forrest Gump, right? Yeah? Yes. Good? In the movie, there's a scene where Forrest decides to run from coast to coast. One obstacle Forrest encounters along the way is running through a pile of dog shit. <laughs> now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, is this girl really comparing grit to a pile of dog poop? My answer, yeah, indeed I am. But let me explain before you judge. Forrest could have easily quit when the going got tough. He could have easily said, oh, I'm going to go clean off my shoes. But instead, do you know what he did? Despite the repulsive smell of the poop or the mushy sensation it left on the bottom of his Nike sneakers, without missing a beat, Forrest goes, shit happens, and keeps on running. In life, stuff is going to happen. And you can't always control that. But in reality, you have two options. Option one is to do the bare minimum to attempt to skate through life. Or option two is to grab the bull by the horns, work your hardest, and achieve success through a positive mindset. Now, no one can make this decision for you. This is something you have to figure out on your own. Knowing this, impacted my college experience greatly. This is why. I knew that I have the freedom to make my own destiny, to choose what path I go down. I knew that I had two options. Option number one, party with friends. <laughs> party with friends and do the bare minimum to pass my classes and get my degree. Or option two, to buckle down, join organizations on campus, and focus on bettering myself both academically and socially to achieve success in the future. I'm here to tell you, option two isn't easy. Having two leadership positions while taking the most time-consuming, stressful courses of my college career isn't easy. 
life isn't easy either. But do you know what gets you through it? Great. <laughs> Knowing that you are born to achieve greatness gets you through it. Now, grit is a learning process. Right? As a 20-year-old college sophomore, I'm okay admitting that I don't necessarily know everything. But what I am willing to do is I'm willing to learn. Being open-minded and seeking out constructive criticism is an important component of grit. I know a lot of us struggle with this. I mean, I myself do. It is hard to admit that you may not be the best at something or that you need help with something. But if we don't ask those questions, if we don't seek out help, how are we supposed to become the best version of ourselves we can? It's simple. We can't do that, right? You can't get any better if you don't learn. Grit is not always comfortable. In fact, grit is becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's putting yourself out there and going outside your comfort zone to learn and grow as a person. Not only is grit uncomfortable, it's imperfect. This can be a really tough pill to swallow, considering it's only human nature to convey perfection. Think about it. By the clothes we wear, our social media posts, even the friends we hang out with, we're constantly trying to convey a reputation of perfection. <coughs> but let me ask you, what exactly is perfection? Perfection is someone else's perception of ideal. Instead of chasing perfection, I challenge you to strive for excellence. Here's why. Excellence embraces failure. Excellence is having the ability to go, yep, I screwed up. Learning from it and improving in the future. Again, it's not always easy, but grit is like climbing a mountain. It's being completely exhausted and having nothing left to give halfway through the climb, and somehow finding a way to persevere and scale the peak. Life is your mountain. And each and every one of you have the tools it takes to scale your peaks, right? I challenge you, when you struggle in life, choose grit. Put yourself in a grit and growth mindset day in and day out. And I guarantee you, if you do that, not only will you scale your life peaks, but you'll achieve great success while doing them. Thank you. Taylor, uh, next, the next speaker that we have is a freshman here at Ohio University, and I would then like to welcome Jack Cross to the stage. grandparents up to Ohio to be closer to the rest of us. So when we did that, we started to bring them to family gatherings. Big mistake, especially with my great-grandma. Now, Nanny wasn't a horrible person, but she definitely grew up in a different world than most of us today. And I'm not just talking about her hometown of Friendsville, Maryland, where everyone you know is either a friend, a frazy, or a fike. No, it's it's about the fact that she grew up in a different time, with different values. Essentially, a completely separate reality than the one we live in today. And it's not just a matter of when you grew up. It's a matter of your family, upbringing, location, among other factors, that lead us to construct our own individual worldviews. And sometimes, these worldviews can clash, and cause really palpable issues. 
So tonight, <coughs> in order to examine the clash of these different realities, we're going to look at what gets us there, some problems with these subjective realities, and how to fix these problems. So first, we have to examine how we create reality in our own minds, and we do this in two ways, biologically and socially. Biologically, how we view reality is ingrained into us thanks to how we've evolved. In his TED talk, Do We See Reality As It Is, Dr. Donald Hoffman makes the claim that evolution has hardwired our brains not to see the world as it is, but how we need to. Essentially, this means that our bodies dictate what we find desirable and how we see the world around us. Take, for example, ice cream. Sweet, soft, creamy, pairs well with every dessert. Cookies, cake, pie, brownies. I could go on, but I haven't eaten dinner, so I'm really trying to hold on. But if I want to eat ice cream, I have to be prepared to be hovering over the toilet bowl all night because I am lactose intolerant. <laughs> According to my body's reality, ice cream isn't as perfect as it sounds on paper. Dr. Hoffman goes on to compare reality to a computer screen. Space as you perceive it is your desktop. Physical objects are just the icons on that desktop. Everything that you see is just light waves bouncing back into your eyes. Everything that you hear is just vibrations going into your head. It's like going shopping and seeing a coat that you think you'll really like. You take it off the hanger, you put it on, and you say one or two things. Oh, this is, this is really nice. I like this. <laughs> or you say, yeah, oh, it's, it's a little itchy. It don't fit as well as I thought. So, we, so you put it back on the hanger, and you either put it back on the rack or you take it home with you but you couldn't have made that decision without trying it on in the first place. Now, the second way that we create reality is socially, as exemplified by our unspoken and overbearing cultural agreement that Game of Thrones is objectively the best show on television. And I would know. <coughs> I've never seen it. <laughs> Clifford Gertz, in his book, The Interpretation of Cultures, notes that different groups across the globe have always had different ideas about how the world is supposed to work. At one point, he talks about Balinese cockfighting and how the men use chickens to settle their arguments. This might sound a little weird to us, you know, men sitting around a ring, betting on chickens. But if a Balinese man walked into an American courtroom, he'd see a bunch of people sitting around in monkey suits, watching two people taking turns yelling at each other, and a guy in a black robe banging a little tiny hammer on a wooden platform. I think that's a little weird, too. It all depends on the environment that you've grown up in and that you've learned social rules from. Karl Marx, an oldie but a goodie, puts it well in his book, The 18th Brumet of Louis Bonaparte. The tradition of the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the living. The father of communism, dire as he makes it, has a point. Monkey see, monkey do. Now, in America, we might not use chickens to settle our disputes, but there are still some ramifications to having our own subjective realities built up. Social barriers and a lack of empathy. But first, the way that we perceive reality around us allows us to construct barriers. Social barriers. I mean, many of us have grown up in homogenous communities, so we know how this plays out. The Reverend and Mrs. Hutchison don't look at their young neighbors down Mulberry Terrace and see when friends going to parties. <laughs> no, they see rampant, rampant paganism, possible homosexuality, Satan worshiping, encroaching upon their community. I mean, it's not that bad, but you know. <laughs> Christopher Ingram, in an August 2014 article for the Washington Post, explains that we have a tendency to seek out and associate with people who are similar to us. Religiously, politically, economically, and, yes, racially. The U.S. may be heralded around the world as a melting pot, but the Congress, our body of legislators that is supposed to represent the people, is 80% white, 80% male, 93% Christian, 98% straight-ish, and 100% of Native Americans ass. <laughs> When we surround ourselves with like-minded people, we put up barriers, alienating those who are different than ourselves. Bill Bishop, author of The Big Sort, states that we now live in a giant feedback loop, hearing our own ideas about what's right and wrong bounce back to us. 
and like big honking red racquetball I throw against my bathroom wall every night. Eventually, it's going to bounce back hard enough to get stuck to my nose, send me to the ER, and fast track my transfer to Clown College. <laughs> and these socially constructed subjective realities can cause us to have a lack of empathy for those who don't live in our same reality. Thank you very much, Jackie. <clears throat> the next speaker that I would like to invite up onto the stage, she's a sophomore here at Ohio University, so I would now like to invite Cole Powers up onto the stage. Thank you, Matt. All right, this is going to be a little weird, but uh, that's usually how I roll. Oh, hang on, we're going to turn the lights off. All right, so I want everybody to close their eyes. I'll be able to see if you're not doing it. I'm watching. Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth for about 30 seconds at whatever pace seems natural and just focus on your breath. Alright, I'm going to kick the lights back on. So, some things you probably noticed, um, you probably were just focusing on your breath, right? You're distracted, you're scatterbrained. Um, I think that's the first thing that I came to realize. Whoa. When I first started meditation, which is what this, uh, this speech is about, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and how that can shift your paradigms with stress. So that's who I am. I'm the director of social media for The Shea. It's awesome to be here. Thank you guys. Uh, it's very humbling to be able to make an impact in the community just by talking. Um, in my spare time, I'm a blues guitarist. I play around town, so that's kind of a little bit about me. And so this is going to be a very long speech. <laughs> so what is mindfulness? Um, basically, this is a mental state achieved by focusing on the present moment, um, here and now, which is what I just had you doing with that breathing exercise. Um, and this is achieved through meditation. So the truth about stress, we're talking about stress, right? There's Macaulay Culkin before he got real creepy, like I said earlier. Um, so a little bit of stress is really good. Um, it can get you to study for your finals, your exams, and all those things. Um, and it can make you be more productive. But what you want to avoid in your life, and I'm sure a lot of us in college and some of the older people in the room know is that chronic stress is very bad. Um, stress levels are rising among everybody, really. Um, there's just a lot going on at the end of the day. Um, so what you want to do is try and reduce these stress levels, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is going to help you with that. Zeke, can you come up here and click for me, brother? All right, thanks. Sorry. Sometimes you got to improvise, you know? All right, thanks, man. All right, so how did I come across mindfulness-based stress reduction? 20-year-old uh, kid, ancient Buddhist meditation techniques, kind of a weird thing to come across. My dad is a Buddhist. I was raised Catholic. Uh, that's another story, but MBSR is non-religiously affiliated. Um, so if you are a religious person, it's not going to get you in trouble. Um, so I was a wrestler in high school. Uh, I thought I was going to go D1. I'm sure everybody in this room thought that. I probably wasn't going to. Um, <laughs> I had a history of concussions, um, caused me a lot of trouble in high school, so I ended up taking my junior year off, got cleared by the doctor to come back my senior year. Uh, I really thought I was going to do it. I came back. Um, I was doing really well, beating kids that I shouldn't be beating. And then uh, Christmas break tournament comes around senior year. Uh, meathead from a school that shall not be named headbutted me, put me out. Um, so that ended my wrestling career unfortunately brought me into probably the lowest point in my life, some pretty serious depression because of that. Um, that was what I identified with uh, throughout all of high school, and that was taken away from me. So pretty low point in my life, and my parents were helping me out. My dad got me into one of these classes, and I'm going to tell you kind of how that helped me. <coughs> flip, flip. All right, here we go. Um, so what this whole program is based on is these seven attitudinal qualities, which I'll do a little turn around here. Uh, beginner's mind, patience, non-judging, non-striving, trust, acceptance, and letting go. So I'm going to go over each one of these and what that means in your life, how it's going to make you less stressed. 
Here's mine. Um, so I think a lot of people in this room are very competitive, and there's a problem in our society that people don't try new things because they think they're going to be bad at it, and they want to be the best as soon as they start. And in my mind, that's a really garbage viewpoint. Um, the expert in anything, as you can see, was once a beginner. That is a redwood sapling, so obviously you guys know those are really big trees. Started that small. So you got to start somewhere. Uh, in life and meditation, anything, um, you got to start somewhere and you don't want to have a bad attitude about failing, really. Patience, uh, something that anybody can use a lot more of no matter who you are. So uh, everybody wants to keep up with the Joneses, but I know uh, we keep up with the Kardashians now, so that's kind of our thing. So what that's kind of a metaphor for is long-term goals, um, especially as a college student. You have the tendency to try and want to control your career, your future, your relationships, your wife, your house, whatever. And sitting here right now, you really can't control that. You can't make that happen just by worrying about it. So you have to be patient, patient to make these long-term things happen. And don't waste your time all the time worrying about them. And then obviously there's short-term patience where you're sitting in traffic like this fine fella, kind of freaking out, getting mad. Um, so in situations like that, just take a second, do, stop, breathe like we did there at the beginning. And it's really going to make you realize that it's not worth getting mad about. Right. Non-judging. All right. All right, there we go. Sorry. All right, we're going we're gonna to have to go off the dome here. Sorry. Um, so we have a natural tendency to compare ourselves to others. That's really toxic. We also have a natural tendency to judge one another. And that's just a waste of time. It's going to make you stressed out and make you feel bad about yourselves. We also have the tendency to judge our thoughts for more than their face value and make a really big deal out of things that aren't necessarily a big deal. Non-striving. So as you can see, this guy, like all of us think we can do, we can multitask. You really can't. If you're trying to work on one thing and that's your main task, you can do multiple things at once. Um, you can see my boy Jimmy Neutron's over here having a brain blast. So, uh, <laughs> so what he's doing is not focusing on the moment and what he's working on. Um, so brain blasts, although they can help you uh, have some new ideas, aren't really a good thing. Trust, another thing that we could all work on. Uh, trusting yourself is key in your success. And a lot of people are really hard on themselves, and that can hold you back from achieving your goals. And trusting others is also really important. Letting go. Buddha said the root of suffering is attachment. So if I do really bad at this speech, right, I'm not going to go home and freak out about it. I'm going to let it go because it's gone. It's in the past, right? So you're worrying about what's happening right now, not what's happening later, not what happened before. Acceptance. Like I've been reiterating, there is nothing going on except for this very second. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, we all have a lot of things to worry about, but nothing's going on but this right now. So daily mindfulness practice, what does this look like? Uh, you got my boy sitting over there looking at the mountain. He is doing a sitting practice. So that's what you guys did at the beginning. You're going to be sitting there breathing, focusing on your breath. Um, there's body scan meditation, which is usually guided, where you have a narration and headphones, and they're having you acknowledge different sensations and you're breathing throughout your body. That'll make you pass out. Do that at the end of the night, you're going to go to sleep. There's also informal practice, which is where you're going to focus on one of those qualities that I talked about. Say you're going to be patient today, you're going to trust more today, and that's what you're going to focus on all day. Um, and then you're going to want to journal some of this stuff to kind of write down what you're learning. Uh, a lot of people do gratitude journals, those are great as well. Um, so why should you do this? It's hippy-dippy meditation, right? Um, you're going to find your inner peace. If you do this every single day for eight weeks, it's going to make a huge difference. You're going to see a difference in how you react to situations. You're going to stop before you react and really have a better outcome. And you're going to choose that reaction. Um, we all have our challenges. Um, everybody's talked about some of their challenges tonight. Um, it's going to help you enjoy life through these challenges and deal with them more proactively. Um, and most of all, it's a healthy way to deal with stress. A couple more slides of benefits. Uh, after eight weeks, it actually changes your brain chemistry. You have more gray matter being developed in your brain. It reduces the inflammation in your brain caused by stress reactions, and you're going to have a measurably happier life um, and more restful sleep. Um, you have an increased ability to focus for longer periods of time, 
and just in general from meditation, and we got a whole more benefits as well. Um, so how do you get started with this? Um, I don't expect any of you to take that eight-week course. Um, if you can, great. But there's a number of apps, Headspace, Calm, and all kind of stuff on YouTube that has guided meditations. Um, very, very much encourage you guys to try that out. Just go sit on a bench somewhere and breathe a little bit for 10 minutes a day, and it's going to make a tremendous difference in your life. So closing thoughts, um, you're really doing a disservice to yourself if you're not at your best um, because you won't be able to help yourself or help other people to the best of your ability. So it's really important to take care of yourself, your mental health, your physical health, and you're going to perform better outwardly if you take better care of yourself. Um, you need to implement some sort of non-negotiable me time. I know some of you have kids, some of you have dogs that are like your kids, um, but you need to have 10 minutes or so a day um, where you're doing absolutely nothing, just sitting there and breathing, journaling, whatever makes you feel calm. Uh, be present, enjoy life as it's happening to you instead of rep reminiscing on what the good old days. Be good to yourself, be good to others, and uh, I believe that's all I have. One more. Tweet it to Shea. <laughs> you need some tweets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cole. Uh, I know you still power through it even with the technical difficulties. But the next person who I'd like to invite up to the stage, she's a senior here at Ohio University, so please welcome Logan Pasquale. Yeah. mounted on top of the pump. <laughs> now I can watch TV while I pump gas? Can it get any better? Then the lady on GSTV Fuelcast told me that I could save 10 cents a gallon on gas. If I had enough points. If I was a member. What? 10 cents? This is awesome. <coughs> Then she said that all I had to do was go inside and sign up for a rewards card. I mean, how easy is that? Then, another lady came on GSTV, and she started giving me a weather report from my town. They even customized the weather stations! <laughs> it was going to be 71 and cloudy, but tomorrow, I had better bring a rain jacket. Then this guy comes on and does a hot new book segment. He introduces a 2016 book by Tim Wu titled <coughs> Attention Merchants. In this book, Wu argues that public spaces are being overrun by advertisements and other forms of media that steal our attention <coughs> and give us nothing in return. I thought to myself, wow, I sure am glad that I never encounter any advertisements that needlessly take my attention for the entire length of time it takes me to fill up the tank in my car. <laughs> Attention theft, as Wu called it, permeates our everyday lives and inhibits our quality of life. To make sure we never have our attention thieved again, we will first investigate what attention theft is and where it occurs. Second, interrogate the effects of this thievery. And finally, pass judgment on a couple things we can do to make sure we put these attention thieves behind bars. <laughs> To understand what attention theft is, we need to understand that attention is a commodity and that attention theft can happen anywhere. First, attention is a commodity. It's something we value, like privacy, personal property, or butterfingers, and no one better lay a finger on my butterfingers. I discovered the first clue as to finding out what attention theft is in an old 1997 article from Wired Magazine, referring to the phenomenon as the economy of attention. Now, I know that this article is about as outdated as my stepdad's sense of fashion, but basically, time and our attention is money. Get it? Because economy of attention. Yeah! Second, attention theft can happen anywhere. Like, for example, 
I may have stood at the gas pump an extra five minutes because there was a sexy news lady talking about a shortage of something somewhere. Probably water. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention to her words. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently even GSTV has to have commercial life. Because after the book segment, Larry the Cable Guy appeared. <laughs> telling me that in just one month of training, I can have her awarding experience in a flexible position with room for growth as a truck driver. <laughs> now I thought about how to get her done for about 60 seconds before... Dang it, it happened again. I fell victim to non-consensual advertising. <laughs> but attention theft doesn't just happen while filling up your tank. According to Isaac Hayes in his 2016 article, Next Up for the Internet, the Attention Rights Movement, much attention theft occurs online. Programmers work tirelessly to maximize our screen time the way they want us to. Like last night, I was watching a video of a little boy doing a cover of a Beatles song, and then YouTube automatically played another video explaining that whole Paul McCartney is dead conspiracy theory, which led to another video on a panel discussion on if the government is covering up the existence of aliens, which led to another video with instructions on how to access the dark web. <laughs> Before I knew it, I was learning how to sell my kidney on the black market for about a quarter of a million dollars. I stopped around the time that I noticed a black van circling around my block. <laughs> Apps and all of the internet are specifically designed to hold our attention for as long as possible. The plot thickened when I discovered the two biggest victims of attention theft are mental resources and freedom of thought. First, attention theft takes away mental resources that we could be spending on things that are actually important to us. In their 2016 book, A Distracted Mind, neuroscientist Adam Gazali and psychologist Larry Rosen write that brains are limited in their mental capacity. Like when I was going into an interview at a job that offered a rewarding experience and a flexible position with room for growth. And in the lobby, there were three TVs playing three different TV shows. Dr. Oz, Oprah, and The Bold and the Beautiful. By the time I got into the interview, all I could think about was kale chips, Tom Cruise, and the fact that Sebastian's fourth wife was carrying the baby from Sebastian's son from his second wife, but it wasn't really Sebastian, it was Seabiscuits! That's right, they had a horse in disguise the entire time! <laughs> that was a very interesting interview. The American Psychological Association reports that doing more than one task at a time can take a toll on our productivity. That night, Dr. Oz came to me in a dream, in the form of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and told me that this attention theft is not only damaging to my mental health, but it is an infringement on my rights. In the controversial 1937 court case Palco v. Connecticut, Justice Benjamin Cardozo writes that freedom of, ex freedom of thought is the matrix, the indispensable condition <coughs> of nearly every other form of freedom. Let me rephrase that. Attention theft violates every right in this. The Constitution. Does anybody <coughs> care about this anymore? President? <laughs> Guess not. Basically, apps and all of the internet are specifically designed to hold our attention for as long as possible. And we think about the things that those who control the ads, apps, and feeds want us to think about. So, what do we do to put these attention thieves behind bars? Corrective action comes in two forms. For you and me, and for ad companies and websites. First, we can regain control of our thought by being more self-aware. In his July 2017 TED Talk, Tristan Harris writes, or explains, rather, that we need to be aware of our ability to be persuaded and distracted. To recognize that we don't want to watch an hour of predictable epic fail compilations. But honestly, someone getting hit is funny pretty much every time. <laughs> Personal responsibility <coughs> needs to be at the forefront of our battle against attention deficits. They can only steal our attention if we fail to recognize the thief before it strikes. Second. Ad companies and websites can ask 
questions to customize user experiences. Hulu used to ask, which ad experience would you like today? You were able to self-select the types of advertisements that you saw during that visit. Tristan Harris takes this idea a step further, suggesting that web browsers can ask questions like, how would you like to be stimulated today? <laughs> Intellectually, humorously, some other way. <laughs> customized internet experience would allow us to self-select what we are focusing on instead of paying attention only to what they want us to. Today, we have investigated what attention theft is and where it occurs, interrogated the effects of this thievery, and finally passed judgment on a few things we can do to take back <laughs> our freedom. Attention theft is real. It's unconstitutional. And I, Never again be excited to see a TV perched atop a gas pump. But at least I can save 10 cents a gallon with my new job that offers a rewarding experience in a flexible position. Room for growth. <laughs> Thank you very much, Logan. Uh, the next speaker that I would like to invite up to the stage, she's a junior here in Athens at Ohio University, Sarah Schroeder. Hi, guys. Okay, now, just bear with me for one minute to kind of go along with this. If I asked you to find something that I have in common with Michelle Obama, Bill Clinton, and Oprah, I'm sure most of you would be at a loss for words. What could I, just a random girl from Cleveland, possibly have in common with a first lady, a president, and one of the stars of Drake and Josh? <laughs> I can stand before you today and say that we are all first generation students. Now, the denotation of first generation means that I'm the first in my family to attend a four-year university. But the connotation is something a lot different. For me, it's been about beating the odds that my educational career has thrown at me because of my family. And I know that this might be hard to believe, but America has a problem. 60% of its first generation college students drop out after their first year, according to research done by Cal Berkeley. And out of that remaining 40%, only 11% will graduate with a degree after six years, not even the four year program that Ohio University has for us. And I know that it seems like one of the biggest barriers we have to cross is just financial, but I, according to the New York Times, there's three other ones. Academic, professional, and psychological barriers. <coughs> Through some personal anecdote and statistics, I'm gonna explore those for you guys today. Now, I'm gonna take that right back to my senior year of high school when I was just starting to visit colleges. And I thought that my only option would be going to Cleveland State University, commuting, staying at home, still being able to support my family. But then I, by chance, got to visit Ohio University with one of my best friends and her family, and I fell in love with this campus. And I knew that I couldn't just resort to going, to staying home and going to Cleveland State. So thus ensued the trials and tribulations of senior year, mostly revolving around filling out the FAFSA, which, at least for my family and I, it's hard enough to remember the passwords for that bad boy every year. <laughs> And then there was also the challenge of um, filling out applications, <coughs> applying for colleges, and the fees associated with that. But that's not all. Even though 85% of first generation students are low income, there are still those other challenges we have to face. I'm going to fast forward <coughs> through prom, prom, through graduation, the summer after senior year, to my first day of freshman year. I had an awesome roommate who I met through Facebook, like I'm sure many of you did. And while my dad and I rolled up in our one sedan, her, her, my roommate came with two minivans full of stuff for our tiny room on Dirty South, which blew my mind. I had no idea that I needed all of this because the lists provided by Bed Bath & Beyond are actually not as helpful as they seem. <laughs> so that's kind of where the psychological part first started. That's the first time I noticed it. 
And then it became, I couldn't always afford to go out with my friends every night like some freshmen love to do. And then we also moved into the academic challenges that I faced, learning how to really study for the first time and things like that. There's also, as you go through your college career, there's a lot of professional challenges you have to overcome. As a junior, I can say that my outlook on school is a lot different than what it was when I was a freshman. I had no idea coming into college that I needed an internship <coughs> to graduate and that I should actually have two or three in order to find the best job possible. I was very lucky to find the Shea Sales Center, which kind of helped me develop all those professional skills that I needed. And I was lucky to get an internship and kind of had to teach myself the ropes because my family couldn't. Um, another challenge that I've had to overcome, what, besides the professional aspect, was um, and the financial um, was dealing with guilt of leaving my family back home because I do live with a single father. There wasn't always the option for me to take time off school and go home and find an, an internship. I had to get a summer job and really help support him because while he does want to see me succeed and pushes me forward, there are also times when he doesn't understand all my needs as a college student. And I just want to sit before you here today and say that I will be an outlier. I am already not a statistic because I am in my third year of school. I will not drop out and I will continue to succeed. And I want to be able for another kid to stand here maybe 20 years from now and compare me to Michelle Obama, Bill Clinton, and Oprah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. The next speaker that I would like to welcome up to the stage, he's a sophomore here at Ohio University, Spencer Johnson. <laughs> I know when that hotline blames, you could only need one, one day. day. <laughs> That's a phrase all of you probably know, and most of you could probably sing. See, a lot of people like to focus on the negatives of hip hop, when there's a lot of positive influences that make it pop. See, way before we were talking about California girls, we were talking about California love with Tupac. Now this may shock some of you. The rest of you already knew. But I'm going to tell you about some of the positive influences hip hop could have had on you. Whether it's brightening your mood, impacting the music you listen to, or letting others speak their point of view on issues you would never hear on the news. See, hip hop innovates. Hip hop inspires. And let's be honest, black people with a voice scare some white people like Michael Myers. They think we're dumb like Andy Dwyer. That's why you hear on songs hard to speak with such a fire. Because we know what they think. Think of the big names and the big chains. They think that one day the rap game would just disappear like David Blaine. But why me? What are my credentials? I've been rapping for three years now, 30,000 views on SoundCloud. I think I got potential. But more than that, I've studied the game for years. And I'm here to fill you in if you feel unclear. Because a lot of people like to focus on the negatives of hip hop when there's a lot of positive influences that make it pop. Now, I am not going to rap this entire presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to focus about the positive influences that hip hop has brought to society today. Society should recognize, relate, and appreciate the value of hip hop today. So let's examine the origins, application, and implications of what Georgia State University June 5th, 2017 calls the agent of change art form. So most of you, when you think of music being made, you think of the artist in the studio, you think of a producer behind some sort of beat pad, mixing and mastering these computer generated sounds to make these rhythms and beats. <coughs> and you would be right. It's how a lot of music is made nowadays. But that's not how music has always been made. According to LA Times, May 9th, 2015, hip hop was actually the pioneer in introducing computer generated sounds to make these rhythms and beats for these artists to speak over. And you hear that influence everywhere. It's to the point that country songs have beats now. And for that reason, <laughs> hip hop might be the biggest influence on music ever. And that's not me saying that. That's not even some expert opinion I drew from a journal. That statement's actually backed by unbiased computer analysis. A group of pop scientists, people who study music for their whole life, got their study published into the Royal Society of Open Science May 9, <coughs> 2015. And they used computer software and Last.fm. If you don't know what Last.fm is, it was basically the eighth streaming service before 
Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music and things we have today. And they, this computer software was analyzing songs from the Billboard Top 100 from 1960 until 2010. And what it was doing was making a graph by grouping songs together on a variety of things, like vocal patterns, rhythmic patterns, instruments used, melodies used, and it would say, this is country, or this is pop. But more importantly, it could say that this is country with pop-like influence, or this is pop with rock and roll influence. And they were looking for the biggest shifts on this graph. A shift would be if at one point all popular music started to encompass things like country-like instruments or pop-like melodies. And they found two very big shifts on this graph. The first one was in 1960 with the Rolling Stones and Beatles called the British Invasion of America. And the second one was the boom of hip-hop in 1990. And they deemed that hip-hop was actually the bigger influence of the two because while the Rolling Stones were in, and Beatles were impactful, they were riding a wave that had already been created. They weren't doing anything new, they just popularized the sound here that was already in the works. Hip-hop, however, brought in its own wave and its own sound, and it completely revolutionized the way they saw popular music was being made on this graph in no other way they had ever seen before. And this unbiased computer software basically deemed that hip-hop was the biggest influence on music in the past 60 years. So chances are, hip-hop probably affected your favorite artists, but more than that, probably affected you. A group of psychologists from Northwestern University, August 4, 2014, set to find out what genre of music has the biggest impact on people's moods and productivity levels. And how they did this was they had a bunch of participants, and as a participant, they played them a random song from a genre of music that was popular. We Will Rock You, Living on a Prayer, Firework. Those are examples of some of the songs that were played during the study. And after you listened to your song as a participant, you were instructed to go and perform tasks. And these psychologists are measuring people's productivity levels based on the song that they listen to. And you want to know what song they found made people the most productive? It's a song by 50 Cent called In the Club. <laughs> <laughs> it's your birthday. We gonna party like it's your birthday. Now, I don't want to assume, but I'm pretty sure we've all heard that song. And they found that songs with heavier bass, aka all of hip hop, made people much more productive and it made them more motivated to work. Another interesting thing that they found about this study was after you listened to your song as a participant, you were given a wheel of fortune type fill in the blank word. And the word spelled P blank blank E R. People who didn't listen to hip hop were likely to fill in those blanks with an A and a P, which <coughs> spells paper. People who listen to hip hop, however, were likely to fill in those blanks with an O and a W, which spells power. Hip hop literally puts power in your brain, whether you even realize it or not. And I can personally attest to this. I was an athlete in high school, and you see athletes coming off of the buses in the arenas with their headphones on, blaring. And I can personally tell you, when I played basketball in high school, before games, we were not back there jamming to Keith Urban. We were not to Taylor Swift. We were listening to Drake, Kendrick, J. Cole, hip hop, because it has that unique ability to really put you in the zone. And it makes you feel like you can do anything. I mean, on my walk over here, I was listening to Kendrick's new Black Panther album to make me feel like I could give the best speech I possibly could, because it has that ability to make people feel like they can do anything. So we've established that hip hop not only shaped our music industry, but can let you get stuff done while feeling pretty awesome about it. But the major impact and power of hip hop lies in two implications. Hip hop can transcend our country's racial barriers, and hip hop can educate the <coughs> youth. Fun fact, hip hop was introduced as the African American subculture in 1970. And isn't it interesting that today hip hop's biggest audience is Caucasian? I mean, it goes to show that hip hop was introduced during a time of a lot of racial tension, but it was able to thrive because people were able to unite with each other over a common art form that they love. As Bakari Katwani notes in his 2006 book, Why White Kids Love Hip Hop, the culture is marked by a nuance, complexity, and sort of fluidity between cultures. In other words, it creates a medium for kids to interact with those outside of their race. So while we may come from two very different backgrounds, we can relate with each other because we both love Drake, or we both love 2 Chainz, And that sort of fluidity has, get gathered, ga oh, has gathered hip hop <laughs> the biggest audience of any music genre in the world today. And it's not even close. 
And now artists have this immense platform, and they can use that platform to educate their listeners, more specifically the youth, because a lot of their listeners are young, and they're listening to music a lot more than they're turning on CNN, or they're listening to world leaders speak. They kind of have a direct reach on the youth, and they can use it to talk about issues they think might not be getting that, that much attention, or enough attention. The biggest example of that is when NWA released their smash hit about the police. And if you've seen Straight Outta Compton, or maybe even lived through the time, you know how that went down. Because it's one thing when people talk about an issue, but it's a whole other thing when it's a hit song, and you have to hear it wherever you go. It demands attention to that situation. It demands action. So today, we've established a lot about the positive influences of hip hop, and I've given you a lot of facts to back up the different positive influences it has. And I've shown you today that hip hop has shaped our music industry. Hip hop can make you get stuff done. Hip hop can transcend our country's divisive culture, and hip hop can educate the youth. But I want to conclude my presentation today with my personal favorite thing about hip hop. And my personal favorite thing about hip hop is its ability to give hope to that kid in that neighborhood that you've never heard of. A lot of people who don't like hip hop, they'll listen to, the, to these artists and they'll hear them depict these visceral, violent lyrics and these shocking lifestyles that you were growing up. And if you're not familiar with that, or you've never been around it, it's gonna shock you. It's probably gonna turn you off from the genre as a whole. But I'm here today to tell you that there's a kid out there going through that exact same scenario that these artists are describing. And they're listening to these people speak and gaining hope from their words because to hear someone that's going through what you're going through and made it out of that, that's going to impact and give hope to a kid that nothing else ever could like that. That's a kid like me, like the, the people I grew up with, people I know lived their whole lives through hip hop, people I know wouldn't have a productive day if it wasn't for hip hop. And I feel like everyone in this room at some point has been down, but the right hip hop song made you feel at least just that much better because that is the power of hip hop. But that's not what I hear people talk about when I hear them talk about hip hop. You look at hip hop and think it inspires drugs. I look at hip hop and think it inspires hugs. <laughs> see, you look at hip hop and see defiance and violence. I look at hip hop and see alliance and triumph. See, people think hip hop's gonna break us from each other when I know it unites us closer with one another. Because I know when that hotline blings, that millions of people around the country and globe will sing. And a lot of people are gonna try and tell you about the negative influences of hip hop. But I hope after today, you know that there's a lot of positive influences that make it pop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Spencer. So our final and last speaker of the night, I would, he's a sophomore here at Ohio University, so I would like to invite up to the stage Sam Lewis. <laughs> So it's funny how we remember things. Most people remember the large moments in their life. You know, when you graduate high school, when you graduate college, maybe for some of you in the room, the day your first child was born. But what about the small moments? The small moments that, when summed up, create the collective view. I want to talk about a small moment that made a lasting impact in my life. And this small moment came in the sixth grade. Now, in the sixth grade, we had the fortunate opportunity of getting read to after recess. And the particular book that we were on was The Princess Bride. Now, most people that know me would probably assume that I do not like this book, nor like this movie. But in actuality, it's one of my favorites. And being the young sixth grader I was, 12 years old, I assumed that good would triumph over evil. Well, unfortunately, about Towards the end of the book, Wesley, the poor farmer boy, who was in love with Buttercup, dies. He died. I was absolutely devastated. Sitting in sixth grade class, I couldn't believe it. How could Wesley die? How is this possible? Who's going to marry Buttercup and save the kingdom? <laughs> and as all these thoughts were racing through my head, my sixth grade teacher slammed the book shut, set it down on the podium, and with a stern look in her eye and a serious look, she looked at us and said, life is not fair. 
<laughs> and the faster you realize that, the better your life will be. Now, this is pretty stern for sixth grade. <laughs> but it's a fundamental truth in life. Life isn't fair. We're not always going to be dealt the best hand of poker in life. But what we do have control over is our thoughts and the questions that we ask ourselves to a reaction. And that brings up the point of our greatest relationship in life. That's the relationship with our thoughts. More specifically within our thoughts, the relationship <coughs> with our questions that we ask ourselves, the internal questions that we ask day in and day out. Now, I classify questions in three categories. You have a minimizing question, a maximizing question, and a digging question. Now, for the purpose of this speech, I'm only going to talk about minimizing and maximizing questions. So what exactly does your brain do when it gets a question? Well, your brain is a wonderful thing. It's a lot like Google. It's a massive search engine that collects everything that's ever happened to you and formulates conclusions. So if you ask yourself a question enough, you will come up with an answer, no matter what. Now, it could be good and it could be bad, because your brain will work tirelessly no matter what if you keep asking a question. And that's good, because your, your brain is committed. But the bad thing is, if you ask yourself a question enough, your brain will create things and tell you answers that aren't true, that aren't real. And we have to be very careful about the questions that we ask ourselves. So, let's take traffic, for example. You're a young professional, you're on a team, you being the natural leader that you are. You spearhead a presentation that you're going to give to your CEO first thing Friday night. <coughs> the week goes great with your team, and you feel confident. Friday rolls around, you're up early, you go for a run, pound a quick cup of coffee, and you're on the way. Now, unfortunately for you, during your commute, Phil, the truck driver, who's, on, who's running on one hour of sleep, dozes off. He veers in the middle lane and creates a 10-car pileup, leading to a two-mile backup, which you're stuck directly in the middle. You come to the conclusion that there's absolutely no way that you're going to get to work out. And I'm sure after a minor panic attack and a couple prayers, you start asking yourself some questions. Now, typically in this situation, we're going to start asking ourselves negative questions. Like, why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? How could I be so stupid? Now, I don't know about you guys in this room. I don't necessarily want to find out the answer to why am I so stupid. <laughs> so let's flip that on the head. Let's flip that minimizing question that we asked ourselves and ask, the mask and ask, and ask a maximizing question. What can I learn from this experience? How can I enjoy my time waiting in the car? What message is hidden in this situation? You see, it's the same exact question, but two or three completely different questions, leading to three completely different answers, three completely different outcomes, ultimately shaping your attitude. You see, folks, the internal questions we ask ourselves shape our attitude. Now, traffic is a small example, but what about the large scale examples? The big examples of the limiting questions that we might ask ourselves. So let's take intelligence. Why am I not smart enough to become a CEO? That's a minimizing question. Let's do a 180 flip. How can I get my brain to the caliber of a CEO? There's a maximizing one for you. Now, what about age? Why am I too young to make a difference in the business world? 180 flip, let's go to maximizing. How can I leverage the power of my youth to make an impact in the business world today? Because you see, folks, it's all about the questions we ask ourselves. In any situation, good or bad, we have to be very careful whether or not we're asking minimizing or maximizing questions. <laughs> it's easier said than done, folks, because everyone in this room will have about 70,000 thoughts today. But unfortunately, 95% of those thoughts were the exact same thought we had yesterday. <clears throat> so how do we break the loop? How do we change the status quo? I believe it's a three-step process. Number one, recognition. Number two, condition. And number three, implementation. So number one, recognition. As my boy Kanye says, admitting is the first step. 
This is extremely important. After a long day of work, I want you to go home, I want you to flip open a notebook, and I want you to reflect on the minimizing questions that you asked yourself. I want you to think about them, and I want you to write them down. <coughs> There's step one, recognition. Step two is condition. Of these three minimizing questions, or minimizing beliefs, if you will, I want you to think of them each individually in two ways. One negative and one positive. Let's start with the negative. I want you to imagine how your life will be if you continue to ask yourself this minimizing question. I want you to sit down and imagine how your life's going to be in three months, six months, one year, two years, five years, ten years. How will your relationships be affected? And frankly, I want you to scare the shit out of yourself. I want you to feel that emotion of fear. When you do that, I want you to pick up that and throw it away, and then step into the positive. What is my life going to be like when I do the 180 flip, when I turn a minimizing question into a maximizing one? How are my relationships going to change in three months, six months, one year, two years, five years, ten years? How amazing will my life be, and how amazing will my personal growth become? And finally, is implementation. So. Instead of at the end of the night reflecting, I want you to begin the morning. I usually typically start with a cup of coffee, some may do tea, some water, whatever your routine or ritual is. Start in the morning, flip open that notebook. Now this time, ask yourself, write down your minimizing, or your maximizing questions that are the opposite of your minimizing ones. For example, my three today were, how can I learn today faster and better than I did yesterday? How can I radiate positivity more today than I did yesterday? And how can I be a better leader today than I was yesterday? I'll leave you with this. In life, I think the beauty comes in the fact that we have the ability to create it as we want to, as we deem fit. And I love the analogy that we are the gardeners of our life, and our life is a garden. And all of us, every single one of us, are planting seeds, consciously or subconsciously. And when you're planting these seeds, some for good, others for bad, I want you to remember and ask yourself, am I asking myself a minimizing question here or a maximizing question? Because ultimately, if you ask yourself maximizing questions, you can maximize your life. Thank you. Okay, thank you.